Welcome to the Health Human Services Finance and Policy Committee for today, Thursday, February 7th, 2019. As soon as members arrive, we will announce a quorum. We do not have a quorum at this time, but our first item of business does not require any votes. And so we'll have a presentation by the Legislative Auditor on medical assistance eligibility. Um, and we'll welcome up Mr. Chris Buzzi and Valerie Bombash. Welcome to the committee. Welcome. Please state your name for the record and proceed. Madam Chair, committee members, for the record, my name is Christopher Buzzi. I'm the Deputy Legislative Auditor for the Minnesota Office of the Legislative Auditor and I oversee the Financial Audit Division. Madam Chair and committee members, I will um, do some brief introductions to set the stage for this report, and then I'm gonna have Ms. Valerie Bombach actually walk through mm -hmm. the details of the report. Um, Ms. Bombach oversees all of our healthcare-related audits. Uh, we're very fortunate to have her. She's a, very much a subject matter expert in our, in our state healthcare programs. So to kick things off, I just thought it would be important to start off by explaining why we do so much work in medical assistance. And probably the shortest answer for this committee today is that you tell us we have to. So we have a mandate in state law that requires us uh, to look at healthcare programs. Um, but beyond the mandate, if we didn't have the mandate in state law, this is an area that I would have the division look at anyway. Uh, because of the complexity of the programs and also because of the cost involved with the programs. Um, when you look at medical assistance, uh, the state participates in over 400 federal programs and the largest, the, some of our largest federal programs are in the upper hundreds of millions of dollars, um, such as transportation aids where you're getting up into the $800 million per year. Medical assistance has about $12 billion of expenditures as of the, fifth, as of the uh, fiscal 17 data, we don't have the 18 numbers completely finalized yet, uh, but as you can see, just even on the federal side of this program, it is, uh, it's over six times larger than the next largest program. So it's really important for us to do work in this area. Uh, when you look at um, the healthcare programs, uh, today's uh, report we're dealing with is gonna be adults without children, um, this is a subset of the population because there's unique compliance requirements for different pools of recipients. We've been carving the population uh, into different pools and auditing them individually. But the Adults Without Children um, represents about 300,000 people um, out of nearly 1.5 million Minnesota citizens um, that, get, uh, that get aid through these programs. And when you look at that same pie chart in terms of, terms of dollars, uh, there's roughly um, pushing $1.8 billion per year in the Adults Without Children category um, out of the po total pool of about $12 billion per year. So Madam Chair, uh, committee members, at this point, I'd like to turn uh, the mic over to Ms. Bombach to talk about the objectives of the audit and then uh, walk through the findings that we had. Um, Madam Chair and members, I'm Valerie Bombach. I'm a director in the Office of the Legislative Auditor, and I want to quickly acknowledge the individuals that worked on this report. Jordan Bionfold uh, was the audit coordinator, as well as Todd Pisarski, Ryan Moltz, and Michelle Bilyeu. So as Mr. Boozy said, we examined uh, whether certain individuals enrolled in medical assistance were eligible to receive benefits under the program. And for this audit, we looked at adults without children. These are adults who are 18 years of age or older and under age 65 and do not have children. For this group, DHS overseas and county agencies administer the eligibility processes. The, group, the process also relies considerably on the state's Minnesota Eligibility Technology System, or METS, to process the information and then either approve or deny eligibility. And we've included a visual of the eligibility process on page 18 in the report, if you have a copy of the report. So our audit objectives uh, for this uh, report were to determine did medical assistance enrollees report accurate eligibility information during 2017? 
did DHS and the county agencies determine eligibility correctly? And uh, lastly, were enrollees who received coverage eligible for the program? So for this population, individuals qualify if household income does not exceed 133% of federal poverty guidelines. Also, the eligibility criteria do not include an asset test, such as bank accounts. So there's no uh, limits on assets related to being eligible for this program. Rather, the income eligibility test relies on what is referred to as the projected annual income of an individual or their household. And then there is a comparison to, of this estimate to income in previous years. So for example, if an individual enrolls in February, um, and they apply for medical assistance, the METS database compares an estimate of the individual's income for the coming year of coverage against previous income uh, that has been reported to federal and state databases. So that's, in a nutshell, sort of the process for how eligibility is determined. So to address our audit questions, we pulled a sample of 100 cases. These 100 cases included 113 uh, individuals. And we reviewed information that was contained in the state's electronic data systems, including METS, that should have been available to DHS and the counties at the time of the determination. We then also obtained more recently reported information on enrollees income from the Department of Revenue and the Department of Employment and Economic Development. And this is information that would not have been available to DHS at the time they were doing the determination. We then did a retrospective review and comparison of the accuracy and completeness of the enrollees reported income to their actual income for calendar year 2017. So based on our review, we found that overall DHS and the counties generally complied with the items that we tested. We concluded that the county agencies determined eligibility correctly for these 100 cases, again, based on the information that was available at the time of the review. However, we also found that medical assistance coverage was provided to some enrollees who did not meet eligibility criteria at some point later during 2017, and this was for several reasons. Our first finding is on page nine of the report. For public health care programs, enrollees are required to report any changes in income or other eligibility status to DHS. However, we found that among our samples, some enrollees did not report a change in income or residence that likely would have affected their eligibility if timely reported. For 15 of our 100 sample cases that we tested, and this covered 16 individuals, the enrollee's actual income for calendar year 2017 exceeded their initial projected annual income that they reported to DHS and the household income limit that's set in federal law. For medical assistance, the income limit is 133% of federal poverty guidelines for the household again. So as you'll see on the pie chart that's sort of blown out there, in nine of these cases, enrollees' actual income was higher, but it appears that they would have been eligible for Minnesota care rather than medical assistance. That is, their actual income was between the MA limit and 200% of the federal poverty guidelines. For the remaining six cases, the individual's income was too high and they would have been ineligible for both medical assistance and Minnesota care. As we will show on this next slide, among this group of 15 ineligible cases, the variance between reported and actual income differ greatly. So for some individuals, their actual income was only slightly higher than reported, about $2,800, and this could have been due to a small raise that they received during the year, while other individuals did not report measurable income to DHS. For instance, on average, about $44,000 of unreported income for each of four cases here in this table. Overall, for all of these 15 cases, we estimated that DHS paid managed care organizations between $26,000 and $38,000 after these individuals could have been deemed ineligible for medical assistance had they reported the changes to DHS. We also audited a separate sample of 60 individuals out of about 2,700 cases whose data suggested that they resided out of state, and we then tested their eligibility history. 
As shown in the chart, 24 of these 60 enrollees that we sampled did not timely report to DHS that they had permanently moved from Minnesota and that medical assistance coverage should have been terminated. DHS did not learn of the change until it had received returned mail, after which the department did end coverage. And for this group, we can't estimate the amount of overpayments because we can't know when they should have reported to DHS their change of address or when they actually moved out of the state. Our next finding includes a repeat finding that we identified in an audit released in 2016. We found 18 errors that resulted in $32,000 in overpayments to managed care organizations for ineligible enrollees, and this was due to errors in the case closure processes. These 18 errors were from our 100 random samples cases and an additional 60 sample cases in which enrollees reported a non-Minnesota address. So these were from two different sampling populations that we looked at. So among these 18 cases, 12 of the case errors were due to county worker errors after they had received information about either a move out of state or an increase in income or an enrollee's failure to provide documentation. And for all of these cases, uh, we believe that the cases should have been moved, uh, closed more quickly than they were. Um, incarcerated uh, people also are not eligible for medical assistance, and we found that in one other instance, a county worker did not um, identify person that we feel they should have identified who was in prison and then subsequently closed the case. And so to be clear on this, um, uh, the eligibility process does check, as it goes through METS, it checks federal incarceration data to find out if somebody is incarcerated. But that's only at the initial eligibility determination. It does not happen as part of the renewal process. There's no check against either federal or state incarceration databases. Um, and then lastly, in five cases, we found that there were system deficiencies between METS and MMIS and there was a lag before the problem was identified and the case was closed. So this is the scenario that we, is a repeat finding from our 2016 report in terms of there's a problem in the interface between MMIS and METS. For our third finding, of our 100 sample cases, we identified 10 cases and the 10 cases covered 11 individuals in which the enrollees were incorrectly classified as adults without children. So DHS groups individuals into certain categories as part of calculating how much to pay managed care organizations to provide health coverage. The amounts vary depending on the category. So for example, uh, DHS pays managed care organizations about $500 per month for someone who would be categorized as a parent, and then about $700 per month for an adult without children enrollee. So for nine of these 10 cases, there was a child in the family and thus the individual should have been categorized as a parent and not adult without children. And for these nine cases, a system error in METS caused these nine miscategorizations. For one of these cases, uh, we found a county worker did not use the correct eligibility determination process and the individual should have been enrolled in a different category, not adults without children. We have several recommendations, some to DHS and then one to the legislature. One repeat finding is that some individuals are not reporting changes in income that could affect eligibility. We think that DHS could identify individuals with these circumstances if the department conducted more frequent eligibility reviews throughout the year. There's a requirement in state statutes directing DHS to do periodic data matching of enrolling information with other data systems at a time between regularly scheduled renewals. Currently, uh, this work was required to be completed by April 2018, but the department has not implemented this process, and it's our understanding that the periodic data matching will go live statewide next month. Um, I'll leave the department to speak to that. It's been a bit since we have released this report. We also, um, again, recommend that DHS resolve the case processing and the programming issues in METS and MMIS to ensure, first, a timely closure of cases, and second, uh, placement of enrollees in the appropriate medical assistance category. 
And then lastly, we think that the legislature should amend state statutes to require DHS to verify enrollee eligibility against state information resources containing incarceration data. The last recommendation arises from our one sample case in which there was more than uh, $6,300 in overpayments to a managed care organizations uh, just in 2017 while the individual was incarcerated. So Madam Chair, that concludes my presentation. I'd be happy to take any questions. Members, um, we'll start Senator Jensen, but uh, prepare your questions. And first one to the gate with the legislature should recommendation gets a guaranteed hearing. So just saying. <laughs> and uh, Senator Matthews, Senator Jensen, Senator Matthews. Thank you, Madam Chair. Thank you for your informative presentation. So on the one slide, you had indicated that you, you looked at 160 persons totaled 160. There were two subsets. And of the 160 persons, there were 18 that identified as problematic. Do you recall that slide? Yeah. And that amounted to a cost to Minnesota taxpayers of $32,000. Uh, correct. And this was a random selection of 160 persons? Correct. Out of a million approximately um, so this uh, so this would be this was a little bit of why we had carved out our population because the eligibility criteria and the processes are a little bit different so we wouldn't compare what we would consider to be an able working adult to somebody who's in a nursing home um, so the the population that we're looking at here it would be about 300,000 people right we would characterize that 18 out of about 300 that I can adjust my numbers. Thank you, Madam Chair. Yep. Madam Chair, can I continue? Yes, Senator Jensen. So I guess just to thank you for that information. So if it's not a million, it's 300,000. Yep. Then we would end up having, if we had 160 subsets into 300,000 and multiplied each one of those subsets of 160 times 32,000, the cost of that specific identified problem would be, we, we would save, that would be $65 million. Is that consistent with your own numbers? Um, uh, Madam Chair, Senator Jensen, so to, cl to clarify on the 60, um, out, rather than the 100, the 60 is actually from a subset of individuals who um, have already been defined as having a non-Minnesota resident. So these were individuals where we are trying to understand how and why um, their eligibility history and whether um, the case was closed correctly and what kind of follow-up occurred. So um, the 60 is out of 2,700 and the 100 is out of basically the, the all of the other adults without children. So it would be, yep. Um, Senator Jensen. Thank you, Madam Chair. So we have two subsets and you're telling me the 60 subset the out-of-state addresses? Yes. We probably shouldn't consider that in our calculation. But we could take the 100, and we could do that. Madam Chair, Senator Jensen, I would say Senator that would be more appropriate. Have you calculated the number as to how many dollars we would save if we had, I mean, I'm, I guess what I'm saying is, you're, so you're taking 100 people and you're randomly checking them, and you gave me a number of 18 were problematic, but I couldn't tell how many of the 18 were with the 100 and how many of the 18 were with the 60. I'm just trying to get a handle on how many dollars are we wasting? And I know it's, it's in the tens of millions. And we had a previous meeting, hearing, and we were all a little frustrated by the fact that the periodic data matching, the duplicative numbers, and all this is, is sort of this black box. And all we want to know is, why isn't this just the highest priority for what we're doing? Why? I would think that you don't need our prompting to say, shoot a mile. We have got a major source of waste here, and we got to buckle down, roll up our sleeves, and get at it. Because, I mean, I can't tell you how many hours we spent in our caucus talking about how to get $20 million to address the opiate issue. And I think we got millions of dollars floating around here. We can't get our damn hands around Madam Chair, Senator Ms. Jensen, Bambach. we do make a strong recommendation that the periodic data matching um, should be started, and we believe that the individuals that are identified here could have been identified by DHS had the periodic data match matching been implemented. Madam Chair. Um, Senator Jensen, Thank please. You. Yes. 
Did you say complete? <laughs> we I was hoping you'd say too. follow. Okay. So here's the question, I guess. In this situation, you've made a recommendation. I would agree with your recommendation. In light of the fact that this recommendation needs to be made and this information wouldn't be on the table were it not for the fact that Senator Benson's been aggressive about this, what do you think the appropriate consequences should be in that department for not having done this on their own? Ms. Bombach, that's maybe outside the scope of your expertise, but <laughs> um, <laughs> Madam Chair, Senator Benson and uh, Senator Jensen, I, that, that's a decision for policymakers. You know, we, can, we make our recommendation and it's really up to policymakers to accept or modify or move forward from that. And thank you. Um, and members, to this information, let's remember, while these are audits, they are not necessarily statistically significant and therefore it's hard to extrapolate. I think what we can do with this information is draft legislation that would get at reforms pointed out and then use this to test the veracity of fiscal notes from the administration. And so that, I think that's an approach that, that we could be more direct on, Senator To the Matthews. point, Madam Chair, <laughs> to the point. Okay, one question. I cannot let you buy with statistically significant in that context. When you say, say statistically significant, you are speaking as an expert who knows what statistically significant is, and you're looking at p-values being less than 0 0.05 and things like that. But to the common layperson, I think this data is absolutely statistically significant because the, the average person and the average senator doesn't have your expertise. I think that was a compliment, so thank you. <laughs> Senator Matthews. <laughs> Thank you, Madam Chair, and I can't follow those lines of compliments that Senator Jensen's able to do, but he touched on some of the questions that I also wanted to express um, to uh, thank you for this report and these numbers that you've laid out, and I want to take some of those same concepts and ask it in a different manner. Looking through these slides when you showed that um, Slide eight, 15 out of 100 cases. Slide 10 was 24 out of 60 cases. Slide 11 was 18 out of 100 cases. And your report was they generally complied. I guess my mind went to a report card. Are we saying that this is the 80th percentile so they get a grade of a B? Or what would, what would, the generally not comply or did not comply rates even look like? Because if, if, if you're giving a light green symbol and generally complied and we have these kinds of potential numbers sitting out there, uh, why, I guess I'd say why did you arrive at the generally complied answer to these numbers in your sample that you gave us? Ms. Bobak. Madam Chair, uh, Senator Matthews. So one thing that we thought, uh, looked at is um, to remind you that our scope of audit work was during 2017. And during 2017, the legislature changed the due date for the periodic data matching. And so um, it was previously due in March, and that was extended to March 18. So that in and of itself, um, we would like to say they should have done it, but but the law extended the due date for implementing that, and that due date was outside of the scope of our audit. It was beyond the scope of our audit. Um, so that that is one point of it. The other has to do with, um, I think that we wanted to highlight that there's an obligation in state law for the individuals to report information, and we think that it's useful for policymakers to um, have some context to the extent to which that actually is accurately happening. Um, the, uh, the problem regarding the case closures, we felt that um, it was a METS issue that extended. It is partially DHS in trying to reconcile those problems. Um, uh, and in, in our view, given the number of cases that were occurring, we felt that um, it, it did not rise to the level of not complying. And then the last piece has to do with sort of the case closure process at the county level. The caseworkers are closing the cases. We just looked at those and for the most part felt like they could have closed them a month earlier. And so it isn't that they did not comply with what they were supposed to be doing. We just felt like they, 
needed to hurry up their processes and that there were opportunities to save money there to just close out the case. Follow up. Senator Matthews. Thank you, Madam Chair, and thank you for the information. So if I'm hearing you right, your, your main point in summary is the problems were the fault of more than just the agency, and so while the slides show things that the agency should catch, the front tag, your color tag at the front is only looking at the agency itself. I'm trying to formulate my question. Is it kind of making sense to you? Um, Madam Chair, Ms. Senator Ms. Matthews, I think I understand your question. Um, I think that we couldn't say the count, for example, on the cases where the cases weren't closed. I don't think we could say that the county um, workers did not comply because there isn't a standard in law for which they are supposed to close a case within X number of days. So we wouldn't be able to move that into that bucket and say they didn't comply with the law. And one last brief one, Madam Chair. Senator Matthews. Thank you, Madam Chair. Um, I don't see the department on the list to testify to this today. Are they planning to uh, speak with us today or at a future date to talk about their perspective in light of this report? Does anybody have that information? Ms. Bombach? I'm sorry. I um, we, I was working on an amendment here. Uh, Senator Matthews, could you please repeat your question? My apologies. Madam Chair, is the department, they're not on the presentation list on our agenda. Are they planning to share their perspective either today or at a future date of their side in light of this audit and what plans they have to fix this? Um, thank you, Senator Matthews. Their experts in this area were not available for this hearing, but we do have a representative from the department who can come up and address these findings. And as I said, as we move legislation in this area, those representatives will be available uh, to help us craft and respond. So thank you. And uh, Senator Kiffmeyer. My apologies, Senator Kiffmeyer. Uh, thank you, Madam Chair. Um, thank you very much, Ms. Baumbach and Mr. Busey, for being here today and for the work that you do. I just wanted to clarify, um, I have a question, but on this one, uh, Madam Chair, if I recall right, the due date for the implementation of the periodic data matching was actually, I think, about three years ago was the original due date? Um, your recall is correct. I believe it was... March or April of 2016, but the department was not able to complete the work at that time, and so it has continually been extended. So the last legislative adjustment was an acknowledgement of the reality that the system wasn't ready. Thank you, Madam Chair. I think it's important for you, Mr. Boozy and Ms. Mombach, to know that was not a uh, date that was set by the legislature, except for the fact that the department failed to implement periodic data matching was supposed to do this. As a matter of fact, had taken into account serious um, millions of dollars of savings that was supposed to accrue because of the periodic data matching that was lost due to the failure to implement. And so it's significant. And just by virtue of that alone, we know you don't have to even take this report for all those statistics. I mean, it points to it severely enough as it is, but the fact that they did not implement and there was savings built into the budget, that savings then was lost because PDM was not done. Mm -hmm. And matter of fact, um, is still not done. I read here in the letter from the department that it says they will start on December 20th, 2018. Um, but they're, they're experiencing increased accuracy, significantly increased data acceptance. However, they are still not, periodic data matching is still not there, and every month that it is not, we are losing state dollars to people who haven't earned it, don't have it, shouldn't have it, out of state, don't live here for whatever all those reasons are, and that money then is not in our budget to do for those who have a real need and are residents of the state of Minnesota. But I think to say that, you know, because of that date, um, that is the agency's own issue in regards to the periodic data matching. I think, don't think we should lose sight of that. I think what I ran into, and I, I've commented about this before, that I think the, the legend that you have of 
uh, generally complied or generally, let me get to here, there's all the words mm -hmm. in doing that, um, that there needs to be something between generally did not and generally complied, because I think in this case that would fit in that next one, because the data that you give here um, I think would support that. I think that something that um, would be maybe something to consider. But we appreciate the work you did do. Um, I think even if it is not that. So would you comment in regards to periodic data matching and what that has meant in regards to the findings that you had and how that might in the future uh, greatly improve the accuracy? Um, Ms. Madam Chair, Senator Kiffmeyer. So, you know, we were very careful when we were looking at our samples to not falsely draw a conclusion that periodic data matching would solve the problem. So we looked at the history, we did some estimating of sort of annual income, um, we looked at the wage data, um, we looked at the type of data to know whether or not somebody had, you know, received a lot of money in December, whether periodic data matching would catch that. Um, you know, so much of eligibility has to do with timing. You know, it's challenging to, if you're looking at somebody who applied during a certain month and yet they hadn't yet filed their tax returns from the previous year. So we were really careful about saying, you know, if, if we considered between May after somebody hired their tax return and we looked at how what their the deep wage data was like and we looked at the endpoint, do we think periodic data matching would have caught it? And we came to the conclusion that of the cases we identified that it would have caught um, the the lack of reporting at some point during that period, really mostly between May and December of the end of the year. You can see on the chart some of these individuals are very close to the line. Um, and if they have a very low wage income and they receive a small raise, you know, that might account for just $2,000. So it's possible in December that would be the point that they would tip over um, to being ineligible or perhaps being eligible for Minnesota care instead of medical assistance. But ultimately, you know, we felt that at some point, maybe once or twice between the time of filing the previous year taxes and the end of the year, that there's an opportunity there to identify additional individuals who wouldn't be eligible. Madam Chair, and just Senator to follow Yes. I think it's interesting because um, when I've entered and gone on a regular tax program, I've entered data in, they can find the name of the employer in our little town and all the codes and all those numbers, I just find it just amazing today that some of this data is so available and that we are somehow hampered in the government entity uh, to do these things. Uh, Madam Chair, if I could ask our fiscal folks, yes, if Senator I could Kim know Mayor. what was the budgeted amount of money that, of savings that the periodic data ma matching had built into the budget uh, that do you remember, or if they remember what that dollar amount was, it was Mr. quite a large sum. Mr. Albrecht? Um, Madam Chair and Senator Kip Meyer, I believe at the time it was enacted in the, the, the savings were relatively small in the first biennium because of a delay in implementation, but in the second, it was about $136 million. That would have been in 18 and 19 at the time. Senator Madam Chair, Kiffmeyer? I think that speaks for itself. I think that speaks for itself very loudly. Uh, that's well over $100 million that uh, they were told that would be savings. Um, and I think uh, no matter, the samples are more specifics in all of that, but I think that budgeted savings, I said if they did PDM, that's what it would mean to our Minnesota state budget. I recall it was $120 million. Uh, uh, Mr. Albrecht referenced $130 130 million? million. That's a pretty good chunk. That would pay for a lot of stuff that we could use and better use in our budget. So I know that what you did is took a, a very fine look and went through all of that. I think the, this other thing was a much more uh, global perspective that um, you were working in a, a detail-oriented thing and, and then they were looking at the larger thing. But that $130 million, I think, in that budget thing, I think it speaks very loudly for what it really cost not implementing it, and as well speaks to the future savings we hope to accrue mm -hmm. uh, when it does. But every month that it doesn't, that is that loss. So thank you, Madam Chair. Thank you, Senator Kiffmeyer. Senator Jensen, briefly. Thank you, Madam Chair. Um, 
I want to say thank you for your report and that um, I would I think I'm going to remember this committee hearing today going forward as a crisis of confidence I tried to get it the numbers in you helped me and I chose to use your three hundred thousand dollars and in instead and that reduced the savings from 200 million down to 65 million dollars and so let me just for the committee just put it this way my district in Carver County is one of the larger districts because we've grown so much over the last eight years we have almost a hundred thousand in my district we have 30,000 households. If, in a make-believe world, everybody in my district was at the median income level, and they paid the 7% uh, Minnesota state tax, the amount of money that we're losing by not being more careful with tax dollars is throwing out all the state income tax paid by my entire county. We took one of the seven counties in the metro area and we said, thanks for paying taxes. And we're just going to squirt it all right down the drain. That's what we're doing when we lose this amount of money. Carver County, we didn't do a darn thing worth anything with your dollars. That's a big number. Thank you. Senator Jensen, for perspective. I want to thank you for the work Mr. that you've done. Uh, Mr. Boozy. Madam Chair, uh, before we conclude, uh, I just wanted to point out to the committee that uh, over the last year, we've done three of these audits and uh, we've had similar results in all three of the audits that we've done. And one of the things I wanted to point out is that this is really labor intensive work. And uh, when you look at all the numbers and the statistics, one thing that's important to note is that the agency doesn't dispute the numbers and the statistics. We walk through every one of these items. So we don't have dispute that you know, that these 18 are in fact, you know, things that the auditors believe are a finding when the agency does not. So that's one thing I wanted to point out. And the second is that now that we've walked through very similar types of audits on subpopulations of medical assistance, this upcoming year, rather than giving you more of the same information, because I'm convinced the statistics will be the same, uh, we are going to be doing a deep dive into the technology system that's used to drive these programs and the processes. So um, we will be undertaking a deep dive into METS and how METS makes its decisions and the controls in that computer system itself in an effort to meet the spirit and intent of the law that you gave us to provide you with information. And we look forward to helping all of you as policymakers um, see factual data to make decisions. And, and thank you for that. Um, and members, if you read the response at the back of the report, the department doesn't dispute, and um, they have some plans going forward, but it's our responsibility to, if they need legislative support or if they need a legislative push, that's our, our responsibility. Um, and I was going to ask you what's next on the agenda for us, so thank you for addressing that. I am gonna ask the department to come down if you wouldn't mind, if you can just stay there. I'm gonna ask Mr. Burdick to come down, even though there is a response in your packet. He okay. came all the way here in the middle of the snow. We'd love to give him the opportunity. Oh, <laughs> Senator Wicklund. I just wanted to ask a quick question about follow-up. Um, on In terms of the periodic data matching, you know, once it's implemented, is that something that then we can see results and that will come from the agency in terms of what they're finding, or is that still a part of what your role would be is to analyze what we're finding with that um, additional tool in place? Madam Chair, He's Senator Wicklund. So I know that the department has son done um, testing and done some estimating and they can speak better to that. but. Obviously, part of the data matching to other databases is something that we want to know um, what is METS doing and how reliable is that information and how quickly is that information updated. And what we really want to have a good, some good confidence in is the repeatability of results, you know, looking at a cohort over time and find out what exactly is happening behind the scenes. So looking at periodic data matching, we would want to know what the results of that is as well. So our intent is over the... Um, for calendar year 2019, um, this would it would be a little bit of a time series over time, looking at what is happening behind the scenes. Okay. Thank you. Anything further, Senator? Oh, uh, just so that will include information that comes from the results of the periodic data matching that's occurring. That will include that in your your 
reporting. Um, Madam Spotlight. Chair, Senator Wicklin, it won't be the full scope of it, but I would say it's within our scope. Okay. Thank you. Thanks. Thank you. And, and actually, it looks like we need two chairs, so I'm going to um, ask you if you could okay. give the department an opportunity. Welcome. Thank you. Thank you, Madam Chair. Matt Burdick, I'm the Legislative Director for Healthcare, Behavioral Health, and Housing at the Department of Human Services. And I do apologize. Our eligibility experts hoped to be here today, but they have been snowed in, so I have clearly drawn the short straw today. But thank you for accommodating. Anything that we can't answer, we're happy to bring back and get um, additional questions answered for the committee. I did just want to clarify, we are actually doing periodic data matching right now. Um, we did the field test, as was noted, this past fall, and that was a statewide test of the functionality. That was something that we worked on with our county partners to make sure that the system was truly functional before we rolled it out so that we were not disrupting their work or creating other unintended consequences. So the first um, batch, if you will, of discrepancy notices have gone out at the end of this past year. Um, folks have until the end of February um, to kind of resolve those and those cases will close and then periodic data matching will occur on a rolling basis monthly thereafter. So the functionality is in place and the periodic data matching system is um, in place. Senator Wickland, to your question, we can provide you some of the initial results from the field test and then what we're seeing with this first um, official um, rollout. So we have those numbers and we are able to provide those on an ongoing basis as the committee is interested. Thank you, members. Senator Kiffmeyer. Thank you. Um, I noticed in the report that they were um, able to identify enrollees who did not live in Minnesota. So they seem to be able to do that, and I was just interested in hearing from you. What do you do to, uh, other than self-reporting? I mean, what are the tools available to you for identifying enrollees who no longer live in Minnesota? Thank you, Madam Chair. Mr. Burdick. Madam Chair, Senator Kiffmeyer, um, uh, several ways that we identify this is when we do send mail to enrollees, if we get return addresses, that's one means that we identify this. We are actually actively looking at what other states have done. In this regard, this is not a problem that's unique to Minnesota. As um, our folks often talked about, we don't always know where everyone is at every moment of every day, um, and that's probably for the best in many um, regards. But we are looking at what other states have done, so it's an active project, but it's um, something that we are consistently trying to work on and see how we can do that. Once we do identify someone, then we um, do close those cases. Okay. Thank you. And Senator Rosen. Thank you, Madam Chair. And Mr. Burdick, is the MET system going to be able to handle these new requirements? Mr. Burdick. Madam Chair, Senator Rosen, I'm sorry, um, could you clarify which requirements you're speaking to? That they're reporting every um, month, is that correct? Oh. Changes to verdict. Um, Madam Chair, Senator Rosen, so the periodic data matching that we've been talking about is um, more of an automated system that checks to see if the records that we have on our files are not are no longer matching with other data sources. Um, and so that functionality is in place and that's what we tested over the fall. And so when we find that, we send out a notice to enrollees to provide information that either says the information that you found through these other data sources is in fact inaccurate, we are, I am still eligible, or uh, if they do not respond, then we do close their eligibility. Thank you. And Senator Wicklin, and then back to Senator Kiffmeyer. Um, yeah, I just had a question. When we were, um, thank you, Madam Chair, um, when we were hearing the report, there was, um, it was reported that some of the cases uh, that um, were um, found to be closable, I guess, I, I don't know, not a great word, but if that they were cases that could be closed um, but weren't in quite as timely a way, and that was due to a worker um, just not not doing it as quickly as maybe they could have. Is that something in terms of training of county? Um, I, I'm assuming that's a county role, that particular function. Is that something that's also kind of in parallel to other efforts that we have to, to be efficient and regain or not spend um, money that, that we choose, you know, don't need to? Um, is that part of it as well? Madam Chair. 
Mr. Burdick. Uh, Senator Rickland, absolutely. So we do provide um, extensive training to county workers. We also have um, means for them to ask questions when things are unclear and we update our protocols accordingly, but that's something that we're continuously working to do better. Um, you know, some counties have more resources at their disposal than others. This is an extremely complicated system, and so we're always looking for ways to improve the training and support that we're providing to our county partners on this. Thank you. And to Senator Kiffmeyer. Thank you, Madam Chair. I was just thinking here about your comment in regards to the out-of-state. Uh, the Office of the Legislative Auditor in the Financial Division was seeming able to find 2,000 to 2,735 people with out-of-state Minnesota address. So two things I would suggest. Hot dog over to the OLA and find out what the heck did they do that they could find them, right? So they might be able to help uh, you in regards to telling you what they did. Second thing, there's a function called the National Change of Address Registry. It's a file. I know the state of Minnesota, there are many agencies who make use of the NCOA. Uh, I just want to be helpful here and say those are two places I think that could very quickly um, be very helpful to you. Madam Chair. Mr. Burdick. Senator Kiffmeyer, thank you for that. I do know that we actually worked very closely with the OLA on this audit and we've had a lot of information sharing back and forth. We are quickly um, getting out of my depth of knowledge, but I'll be happy to respond with a little bit more details. I think your, your question is well taken. Thank you. Okay. Thank you. And members, that is all we're going to cover on this subject today. I look forward to, um, as reform ideas come forward, us, us using these audits as support for legislation or scrutiny on the bills as they come forward. Thank you both for being here. And members, we do have a quorum. Thank you all. Um, first on our agenda is a Senator Hoffman bill, but I do not see Senator Hoffman. And, oh, he is, okay. <laughs> okay. Madam Chair. Thank you, Senator Hoffman. Senator Abler. I'll move the bill. Thank you, Senator Abler. We have Senate file 146 in front of us. Senator Hoffman, please proceed with your bill. Thank you, Madam Chair and members. And uh, the, I will not be moving the A1 amendment. We will, um, there was some language in there that we thought we clarified, but so I'm not gonna bring an A1. I can't move it anyway, because I'm not in your committee. Madam Thank you, Chair. Senator Hoffman. So thank you for bringing that to my attention. So Madam Chair and members of the committee, um, thank you for hearing this important bill. It's Senate File 146, and it, it brings to the front care coordination for children and youth with special health care needs, which has become recognized across the country as an essential service to assure quality health care, especially for children that have met, uh, medical complexities. Uh, and, and I'm gonna give you some examples. There's some handouts that you have uh, which are gonna be um, highlighted. One is called Reflections on Care Coordination. That's the Children's Hospital Association and their concept of care uh, that they did through CMCs. There's another one that is there on utilizing family-centered processes that address outcomes to access um, the uh, hospital to home transition. And then finally, there's a note on the family of children with uh, medical complexity, a view from the front lines, which was done, um, which was done under pediatrics and, and presented through the uh, American Academy of Pediatrics. So with that, in 2016, Family Voices of Minnesota conducted a survey of 212 parents of children with medically complexity from 12 different states and, and asking the parents what they wanted from healthcare providers who provide care for their children. The number one issue that families identified that they wanted was coordination and communication among providers. Uh, and over the past several years, uh, there have been multiple national projects that have been focused on improving systems and services for this population using, using strategies that, that, uh, that include care coordination. The Centers for Medicare and Medicaid Innovation Grant facilitated through the National Children's Hospital Association did a three-year project that was called a Care Award. That involved 10 of the leading children's hospitals from around the country with more than 8,000 children and their families and 42 primary care practices. But the project demonstrated was that children with medical complexity who have multiple chronic conditions 
conditions requiring, requiring care from several specialists depend on the coordination of supportive services to achieve their math, maximum health and wellness. Um, care coordination is particularly crucial for the optimal health and care of a child with medical complexities. And what families often report was that the fragmented care from a lack of active coordination uh, or services is, is happens and, and there could be a, a duplicative or unnecessary services, but more importantly is an unmet service need, excessive wait times and lack of information sharing needed. Uh, what the CARE Award showed and the results from that study was that uh, improvement in patient experience and reductions in medical utilization and spending that could be useful for making care coordination case and that was included was a team-based approach for the overall care coordination to the system and that's what they said is needed. These are the professionals saying this is what families need, Madam Chair. So I, I, could, I could keep going on and on because um, again, the American Academy of Pediatrics study showed uh, three things, uh, coordination of care across settings um, permits an integration of services that it's centered on the needs of the patient and the family and that led to a decreased healthcare costs, reduction in fragmented care and improvement in the patient family experience of the care. So uh, with that, Madam Chair, I have more, but I know in the interest of time, I would like to uh, uh, say please pass this to the floor. It's moving in the house as well, so thank you. Thank you, and members, questions for Senator Hoffman, Senator Abler. Well, Senator Hoffman, thanks for bringing this bill, and I like it so well, I'm a co-author, but I, I was absolutely puzzled uh, even that we need a bill like this because I thought that was the design of our health maintenance organizations or management or whatever they do. Um, are you saying they're not really health coordinating organizations? <laughs> Senator Hoffman. Uh, Madam Chair, um, Senator Abler, anecdotally you know that uh, is a true statement and um, uh, you know, I personally um, am grateful for uh, your help in not only my own situation, but other families that I've known and throughout the years. But it's really sad, um, Madam Chair. Years ago, when when um, medical home was brought to the state of Minnesota, and it was established under uh, a couple of different projects, one of the things they really talked about was the coordinated, comprehensive, and collaborative care for families and children, especially the most complex medical needs. Dr. Jeff Schiff had done um, studies back then that showed beyond a shadow of a doubt that um, that if, if a child had a medical home team and that they had good coordinated care, that there was a decrease uh, in, in the use of the emergency room as its primary care, right? This was years ago. Matter of fact, Senator Abler was a state representative and was one of the folks that brought that to Minnesota. And here we are years later saying, what haven't we got from that or what haven't we gained and why isn't a family given a go-to single point of contact care coordinator to help them connect the different uh, services or provi provisions that are out there. And, and here's an example, uh, Madam Chair, uh, to go in what Senator Abler is talking about. You know, if, if the hospital is saying one thing and your primary provider is saying another thing and the HMO is saying another thing, a lot of times the families aren't understanding what those saying things are and there needs to be somebody to help bring that coordination together. Thank you. Senator Klein. Madam Chair, Senator Hoffman, thank you very much for the bill. Um, I'm going to take a small issue with the cost saving um, that you suggested would be a result of this bill. One of the greatest costs, uh, drivers of hospital costs is delayed discharge. And uh, it may be the case uh, that a patient will be prepared for discharge and that these services, while necessary and appropriate, uh, let's say a patient is discharged on a Friday evening and services can't be established until Monday morning uh, and wouldn't be necessary until Monday morning. Uh, it would be, I think it would be possibly be an improvement in this uh, bill if we didn't use the language made before discharge and uh, inserted language, perhaps something like made at an appropriate interval or at a patient safe interval. Uh, just a suggestion. Senator Hoffman. Madam Chair and, and uh, Senator Klein, thank you. You know, unfortunately, that's, that's great if there's honorable intentions aside, but the, what families really wanted, and, and, and the, the, the reports I gave you too would kind of highlight that the need for that care coordination is a singular go-to person. It's not necessarily saying I have the full plan in place, 
But if I'm sending a parent out, and I'll give you a, a real life example, and they're supposed to contact the, the HMO and they're supposed to contact the provider that's supposed to get the pharmaceutical company involved because there's this medical need that's, and I'm giving you a real life example that's there. Um, those three contacts just got lost because then the medical pharmaceutical provider is saying, no, we have to go through our own prior authorization. So all of a sudden now you have these four different entities that are going and there isn't a single go-to care coordinator like a nurse or a care case manager, I don't care what you call it, but that single point of entry that a parent or a family can go to say, can you help me uncover why this is so hard and what's the plan in place? So I think, um, again, Going back to what the Family Voices did with the, the various states, they said the number one thing that families wanted was that communication between those providers. So um, that's, that's where that lies and it, it makes total sense. And the other thing too, Madam Chair and, and uh, Senator Klein, um, you were probably there when the, there was a Pediatric Quality Control Council that was put together um, that uh, folks at HCMC were part of, Gillette Children's, I remember um, uh, Dave Durnberger was part of that, um, Dr. Jeff Schiff put that together. This was all the discussion of medical home coming to Minnesota and that's all they talked about was trying to make sure that there was coordinated care planning that's going on place for people. And in the case of somebody being discharged from a hospital, that's, that's even more important, so. Um, thank you, Senator Hoffman. I have had uh, some stakeholders talk to me in my office about some challenges. Is there anyone from the public who would like to come forward to raise concerns with the committee about this bill? I know um, it's hard to stand up and say, <laughs> we don't think that care coordination is a good idea, but we also need to understand there are uh, realities if this does back up uh, a hospital. Uh, you know, if this is more broadly applied than maybe Senator Hoffman attended, so I just want to give the public a chance. If nobody wants to come forward, we'll continue with uh, committee questions. Okay, and I'm seeing no members of the public standing up, so uh, Senator Abler. Well, thanks, thanks, Madam Chair. I, I, I wasn't facetious in my question. It just seems like this is redundant, and I, <laughs> unfortunately, it's not truly happening, and whether with regard to the hospital needs and so on, if we don't coordinate the care well, it's going to cost more, but worse than that, bad things will happen to the individual for whom the coordination isn't happening. So um, I'm surprised no one wants to testify about it, but I, I think it's a good idea and we just may move it forward. Thanks. And I will say I've had a, a couple of opportunities this year to be engaged in a patient discharge and, and you need somebody who's a fierce advocate. If things start moving quickly, you need somebody who um, can go to the right places and make sure the right thing's done. And the, the hospitals, in my experience, have done a good job, but you have to ask and you have to be specific. And so um, I think we're trying to find the right place here. Senator Hoffman, um, I want to thank you for bringing this bill. It is my intention to send this to the floor members. And so Senator Hoffman, a brief closing comments. No, Madam Chair, I want to uh, thank you for hearing this bill and, and thank you for your input on some of the proposed changes I wanted and, and uh, I just wanted to say thank you for, for hearing this because it truly is, this is something that we should have figured out a long time ago and now let's just hold them. So thank you very much. All right, members, uh, Senator Abler renews his motion that Senate File 146 be recommended to pass and placed on general orders. All those in favor say aye. 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 Those opposed, no. Your bill is passed, Senator Hoffman. Thank you for your work. Thank you, members. Uh, Senator Dreheim with Senate File 13. It's, uh, you know what? I'll let it be author's choice. You can choose what you'd like to do first, but uh, Senate File 13 is what's on my agenda. Thank you, Chair Benson. And uh, Senator Dreheim, will you move your bill? And I think members have in their packet an amendment. Do you intend to move that as an author's amendment? Chair, if it's all right with the committee, I'd like to do uh, Senate File 131 first. Okay. Members, Senate File 131. Senator Dreheim moves Senate File 131. Please proceed. 
So th this is the uh, scene bill we had last year uh, that was put in the supplemental bill that uh, didn't quite make it. Um, you know, the, the whole idea here is the facility fees that institutions charge um, should be uh, readily available and uh, transparent to the consumers so they know what the fee is when they go into a hospital or clinic. Thank you, Senator Dreheim. Um, and let's see, would any members of the public like to testify on Senate File 131? Please come forward. State your name for the record and briefly comment. Thank you. My name is Mary O'Connor. I'm from Brooklyn Center. Um, Madam Chair and members, I'm in favor of Senate File 131, but I have a suggestion that might eliminate the need for Senate File 131. And my suggestion is to reduce the cost of health care. So I'd like to give that now. Um, if we could have a page. Um, I don't believe this information was made available to the committee beforehand, but I would ask you to keep your comments brief and directly to the bill. So if you have a handout you'd like us to read, that's fine. But if you could address the provisions in the bill, that would it's, be most helpful to us. Okay, but uh, it's just that this, my suggestion would probably eliminate the need. That's how I'm relating it to the bill. Because otherwise I just want to give my suggestion to you for reducing the cost of health care. It is quite short. Okay, please proceed briefly. To reduce the high cost of health care, we need to reduce the amount of health insurance we have. We only need major medical health insurance. We need to pay for minor medical expenses ourselves. Doctors will lower their charges if they don't have to wait for an insurance company to pay them. The best way to start this process is to reduce public employee health insurance benefits to major medical health insurance only. Then give each employee an increase in pay which they can use to pay for minor health expenses. We have to do something soon to solve the high cost of health care. It takes a big group of people like public employees to increase competition and bring prices down. Minnesota can be the leader. Start this process with our state employees and show our nation at the federal level and other states how to bring down the cost of, of health care. Thank you, Ms. O'Connor, for your comments. Yeah. Thank you. And if you could please sign in. And then, Senator Dreheim, do you have anyone that you would like to bring forward to testify for or against? Welcome to the committee. Thank you, Madam Chair. My name is Bentley Graves. I'm with the Minnesota Chamber of Commerce. Um, I appreciate Senator Graham bringing this, this legislation forward again this year. This is um, uh, related in some ways to, uh, to legislation that we had worked on with Senator Graham last year, which uh, uh, put for the first time in place a, a turnaround time frame uh, for good faith estimates that, that consumers may be looking for from a hospital or a provider. Um, and also for the first time then included uh, within that good faith estimate a requirement that the estimate uh, include any information about facility fees that might be charged. And so we appreciate, uh, again, Senator Draham bringing this back forward. You know, as I mentioned last year, you may recall, uh, is, is um, you know, this is a, this is a growing the issue of transparency and, and ensuring that, it, that employees um, are able to, to effectively use the benefits that their employer, the health insurance benefits that their employers help provide for them um, is of growing importance. And um, as, as most of you know, plan design uh, has continued to move in a direction um, that, that puts employers more and more in the driver's seat, or I'm sorry, employees more and more in the driver's seat when making decisions about their health care. Um, and that's particularly true here in Minnesota. In Minnesota, we have um, uh, a higher proportion of plans with deductibles out in the marketplace. Uh, those deductibles themselves are, are higher in Minnesota than they are in, in the rest of the country. And when it comes to high deductible plans and specifically, um, we, have, we have very, very high uh, um, percentages of, of those plans in the marketplace. And so, again, um, you know, employees in Minnesota are, are uh, being asked to, to be wiser and wiser shoppers of uh, healthcare services. And, 
uh, this bill uh, helps kind of move the needle incrementally in the direction of, of putting more information uh, in their hands to make those good decisions. So thank you for the opportunity to testify and, and thank you, Senator Drahan, for bringing this forward. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, questions from members? Okay, seeing none. Senator Dreheim renews his motion that Senate File 131 be recommended to pass and be placed on general orders. All those in favor say aye. aye. Opposed? Thank you, Senator Dreheim. On to Senate File 13. Thank you, Chair. Um, I, I would like to just thank the, the co-authors and the other people that worked on, the, on these two bills. I forgot to mention that earlier. Um, unlike the previous bill, this is, this is a new idea that we came up with. Um, just be a, a little more um, transparent, I hate to keep on using that same word, on, on the billing statements that we receive and a little more timely. So the, the whole intent of this is to um, speed up the process that we get the statements from the hospitals and to have it in plain ling English, plain language, so the average person can understand the billing statement. And we, and we do have an author's amendment on, on this bill. Senator Dreheim moves the A2 amendment. All those in favor say aye. aye. Opposed? Thank you, Senator Dreheim. So on, Please proceed. Uh, thank you, Chair. Um, so what, what we did is we changed the days um, from seven days uh, to 21 days. Uh, to try to give the hospitals a little more time uh, to uh, get a statement ready and prepared. That's really, a, it's pretty straightforward. Um, we, we do have um, a testifier that was going to be here today. Unfortunately, uh, due to weather and other events, we couldn't, she couldn't make it up. Uh, but there is in your packet a letter from her or what her testimony was going to be. Um, and. Uh, a summary of, of the billing statement that she did receive. And I think most of us know people that have had a procedure done in the hospital and uh, in visiting with them, it's, it's very common for them to complain, at least to me, that they don't understand the bill they got. And, and that's what we're trying to do is move a step forward where we can understand the bill that we received or multiple bills from the hospital so it's more clear. Thank you, Senator Dreheim. My caution with two doctors on the committee that they might start explaining what some of these terms are. So we'll be, we'll be thoughtful about the time we spend on this. I do have, um, in addition to the written uh, testimony that outlines a motivation for this bill, we have Ms. Mary Krinke from the Minnesota Hospital Association who would like to speak on behalf of the hospitals about, about implementation. Uh, thank you, Madam Chair and members of the committee. For the record, my name is Mary Krinke, and I'm with the Minnesota Hospital Association. Um, regretfully, the Minnesota Hospital Association has to oppose Senate File 13 in its current form, and I have had an opportunity to meet with Senator Dreheim, and I'm hoping as this bill works its way through the legislative process, we might be able to make some additional changes to it if, if he or might be amenable to that. So if the bill were to follow the same standards that we have for Medicare patients, uh, the Hospital Association could support this bill. Um, Medicare has three clear standards for providing information about an itemized bill. The first one is the number one, the hospital has 30 days. This is not a number that was just chosen at random. Uh, CMS determined that that would be a thoughtful number based on getting all the notes from physicians, getting the coding done. If the hospital has an offsite lab or an offsite pharmacy, they thought that the 30 day notice, uh, 30 day requirement was the right amount of time. I would also say for hospitals, Medicare is about 50% of our patients, so having something consistent would also be helpful. Um, number two, Medicare requires that there be no cost to the individual patient that asks for these uh, itemized bills. Number three, the information is only sent to those Medicare enrollees who request it. Okay, so those are the three criteria that Medicare has. Last year, Minnesota hospitals cared for approximately, well, actually it's exact, um, 521, 240 
patients on an inpatient basis. So we have 142 hospitals in Minnesota, and I realize this is an average, so obviously larger hospitals have more discharges than smaller hospitals. But on average, that would mean each hospital would be sending out itemized bills, itemized statements of charges to 3,670 individuals. Now, I just want to use for an example like a neonatal patient at a children's hospital. They stay at a hospital for maybe three months. Their statement of charges could be over 250 pages. And for many of our children's hospitals, Medicaid is their largest payer. Maybe 60% of their payers are Medicaid. So sending an itemized statement to a Medicaid family, uh, 250 pages worth of itemized charges could be very overwhelming, confusing, and actually very stressful for a family member to receive that statement. This new, this new government mandate would add processing, mailing, and call center costs for hospitals with no patient care benefit. Worse yet, it could be confusing and add heartache to individuals as they receive these itemized bill charges. So this is before the bill goes to the insurance company. So for most Minnesotans, and I realize we do have about 3% private pay, but for most Minnesotans, their bill is sent to the insurance company first, whether that be Medicare, Medicaid, commercial insurance. And the patient's statement of financial responsibility responsibility is what they receive. What portion do they owe? That is what patients are most concerned about. They want to know, what do I owe? So this bill doesn't really create better shoppers because it's after the fact. So the previous bill that uh, Senator Draheim had about posting our facility charges, that's before health care services are delivered. This is after the fact, and a lot of hospital stays, like a heart attack or car accident, you're not really shopping for your next inpatient admission because hopefully it won't happen again. So you have these large itemized statements. So we sent out a survey to a number of our members, and obviously they were concerned about the costs with this bill. Um, I did get back one comment that I thought might be helpful as we continue to, to work on this issue. Um, so hospitals send out a patient financial responsibility statement. This is what the patient owes. And one of our members said that they put a line on all of their statements that are sent to patients that says if a patient desires a detailed bill, it could be made available to them upon request. So I want to be clear, we're not opposed to sending out a detailed bill to someone if they ask. What we don't want to do is mail these out to 500,000 Minnesotans when it's not what most folks are interested in. So we know there would be a lot of pushback from our Medicare and Medicaid patients in particular. So I do have one new topic I need to raise, and, and I'm sorry. This was in the amendment that was added. Um, I actually think the original bill language on, on the wording was a little bit clearer. I'd like to ask the two doctors on the committee, if I may, <laughs> I'm a little concerned about the language that says technical terms are customarily used by patients. And I know that they don't want us to group things like miscellaneous charges or supply charges, but I'm not sure if like the term electrolyte panel or electrocardiogram, what is a medical term versus what is a non-technical term? I think that's a little vague to us. So. Um, thank you, Ms. Cranky. And so... Uh, I know that council has had some help in trying to find the right words for this language. I will defer to Senator Klein. He indicates he might have some ideas. So that I thought I saw you raise your hand. I don't want to put you on the spot. So Senator Klein. Madam Chair, I can address the question and also to the larger amendment, if that's okay. Please. <clears throat> Madam Chair, Ms. Krinke, uh I agree that the language is vague. I'm not sure which technical terms in medicine are commonly accepted by the general population, so I, I think that language would need to be fixed. Obviously, I support the bill. I'm an author. I support it in concept uh, for the very reason that uh, sort of public awareness of these charges will actually drive hospital behaviors. If, if you get a bill and it says that you were given an aspirin every day and that aspirin costs $25 each time, 
uh, I think that will have an effect on how we deliver health care and it will so save costs. So I think that's meaningful. If you get a bill and it says that you were charged for a dermatology consult and you don't ever remember seeing a dermatologist, I think that also would be impactful. So I think uh, these are important things that uh, more visibility would would help. Uh, I, I, I wonder what the path for this bill is. I actually don't think it's ready for general order. I think there's some work to be done in concept. I think it's a great idea, uh, but I think we could clean it up. Thank you. Okay, thank you. And Mr. Monaghan, you did help with drafting. Could you talk to us maybe about the source of some of this language, if you're comfortable doing that? Um, I'm not trying to drive this to a point, but I want to um, I want the committee to be aware that there was some work done trying to get this to a good place. So, Mr. Monaghan. Uh, Madam Chair, members, I can describe the process. Um, so, when I saw that the bill was scheduled for a hearing, I reviewed the bill. Um, I found the expression um, may not use terms that are indecipherable to be vague. Um, so what I did was try to find current standards in state statute that deal with plain language. Uh, I went to the Plain Language Act, which is designed to cover uh, consumer contracts and uh, department or agency documents. And I pulled the language from uh, the Plain Language Statute and modified it in a way that was appropriate here. I did not cross-reference that language. I did not uh, invoke the enforcement standards in that act. I just used the standard for plain language that appears in the Plain Language Act. And then I offered that uh, language to the senator, and he accepted it. Thank you, Mr. Monahan. I just don't think members know that there, there is already this language somewhere in statute. And again, I'm not trying to drive to a point, but this this wasn't just senators sort of spitballing and trying to find the the right words. We aren't there yet, perhaps, but we we take it seriously, Senator Klein. Sorry, Madam Chair. Uh, the second point I would make, Senator Draham, is that uh, I think Mr. Uh, Krinky raises a good point about uh, the large delivery costs of a paper document and getting a phone book in the mail with billing may not be the most useful. So I would suggest as we move forward, we consider the option for electronic delivery of these charges. Thank you. Senator Draham. Thank you, Chair, and, and uh, thank you, Dr. Klein, uh, for, your, for your input. Um, so just if I could comment on some of the things that have been said. Um, thank you, Senator Draham. The, the the 30 day when, um, we sat down and, and discussed the bill uh, with Ms. Krinky. We, we talked about the, the polling she did with her members on, on the time frame that they could get it done. And it, and it was obvious that seven days was too short. And the longest that was on the list really was 21 days. That's why we switched to the 21 days. I, 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 I can understand their point with the um, federal policies being at 30 days. Um, my understanding is there's nothing in statute that would prevent them from emailing these statements out. And if we need to add language to strengthen that, I would be happy to do that, Dr. Klein. Um, to Ms. Krinky's point about the no charge, uh, there are three points. The last line 1.14, I think addresses that. Um, and then upon request, I, I, I guess the whole idea is to get people uh, the information. When I bring my, my car in to the shop, I expect an itemized bill. So I know what they did and what I was charged for. Um, and the same principle would be going into a hospital. And, and I, I don't think that it will help people shopping for hospital services. That, that's not the point. Mm -hmm. But I, I think we owe the, the citizens of Minnesota the, the transparency and the plain language in a bill, a medical bill. So that, that's the intent, and I'm happy to work with anybody on, on revising the bill. Thank you. Senator Abler. Well, Senator Drehheim, I uh, really like where your bill would go. Um, just in a practical sense, um, we uh, people get statements from us. We have like a 
six things we do, so it's really not hard. And, um, but I was just thinking of the logistics of this itemized statement in plain language. Um, it's a world, well, you've, in your experience in the human services side, it's a world of acronyms, and the people in the system know what they mean, and they're, quite active, they're actually quite descriptive. The thought of going to a DHS party with some people having a little bit of wine, throwing around acronyms is a frightening thought, laughing at each other's jokes that no one gets. But anyway, so that's the world that is there. Um, and so in these, there's a practical piece that you, I think I'm going to encourage you to consider as you seek plain language uh, documents and in a in a bill for in a bid for a muffler job that you would muffler yes. parts. I mean, it's there's no terms and there's no codes for those yes. and billable hours or such. But in a in a significant hospital stay where you go and have a lot of work done, you could have a dozen pages or more of single item uh, things that somebody would have to go through and rewrite the entire bill which uh, it's just, just with all respect, simply impractical. And uh, I don't know, Madam Chair, if you're willing, if this is going out today, um, I have a suggestion if you want to move it out today, how you could make it work if Senator Dreheim is willing to not have plain language. Um, and I, th I think what you're trying to do is provide people the chance if they ask, and if they're encouraged to ask, to get a bill. And I do believe, though, uh, on the contrary to people saying, oh, they're not going to shop on their way to the ER to see what the best deal was. I do believe with Senator Klein's comments, you start seeing you're paying $300 for a guy who came in for a minute. Uh, they might find that to be offensive and go like, what's that code? Well, that's not extended. They were there for a minute. And it, he said, hello, and that's not exactly complex. And so then this would have some pressure. And so the, the good you want to have uh, can happen just with the fact that it exists. And so first, Madam Chair, is this... Are you intending to move the bill out today, or are you going to hold it over? Or what were you thinking? Yep. Senator Abler, it was my intention to move the bill, but um, given the committee's testimony, I'd like to hear from Senator Dreheim if he'd like to move to a vote, if he wants to continue to work on language and, and come back here, or if he thinks an amendment on the floor uh, would, be, would be the way to resolve the of question. Course, so, sure. Senator Dreheim, I, I would say that we could leave it here and have the opportunity to do more work, but I had committed to you that we would place it on general orders and I don't want to take back uh, okay. that commitment. Chair, thank you. Um, yeah, I'm willing to work with everybody uh, uh, to improve the bill, that's the whole idea. Um, I, I really don't want to give up the language piece of the bill. I, I, I think it's important that people understand the bill, uh, the billing statement when they receive it. Um, and I understand there'll be lengthy pages. I, I, I get that. Um, I, I'm willing to do the email or mail just to clarify that, um, but I, I don't think we have anywhere in statute and maybe um, council can, is there anything in statute that would uh, prevent a hospital from emailing out the, the statement? So they, they would have the option of emailing it or mailing it they already have to do the bill, so it, it's. I, I, I don't. I don't see the. I, I would prefer to take it to the floor, and uh, if we have to do an amendment uh, and uh, amend it on the floor, that that's the path that I would like to see. Okay, members. Further is Senator Wicklin. Um, it. I think. Senator Abler is probably formulating something, so if we are to the bill, um, that is just fine. We'll, we'll take up both issues to the bill and the idea of moving it. Senator Kiffmeyer after Senator Wicklin. Go ahead. Uh, thank you, Madam Chair. I, I just have some comments about specific language in the bill. Um, based on, I'm, I'm, I'm for transparency. I'm for people being able to access all of the information and being able to understand it. Um, I do think to the points that were raised about concerns, um, I, I don't feel comfortable putting a second timeline when there's one timeline that's 30 days and that's, you know, 50% of the billing. I'm not comfortable putting a, a, a separate timeline for this of 21 days because of adding complexity to the process. That doesn't seem like it was would serve people very well. Um, and then I think in terms of the 
the language about what the itemized description should include. I certainly think that um, stating that it shouldn't include uh, miscellaneous charges or a billing code if, you know, because that that is difficult for people to understand, you know, what does that mean? Um, I think I'm still a little bit, I'm concerned about the way this uh, plain language description, um, medical jargon, I guess I don't, I don't know if we have a good idea about what would be medical jargon and what wouldn't. Um, it's the same as those technical terms that are commonly, customarily used. Um, so I, I think that really needs, it needs some work to, you know, kind of fulfill a question of is this implementable? I mean, can we actually do this in a meaningful way for patients? Um, I'm sure it can be done, but I'm not sure that this language would get us there. And then um, I guess I'm still more comfortable with, you know, the, the patients having access to it and then being able to say, do I want an electronic version or a paper version? I, I have concerns about generating statements out to people that who you know, don't don't want it or aren't expecting to receive this in addition to an insurance statement that clarifies you know what what's been paid and what's I'm just not sure how um, well that serves people and the cost of doing it I don't know if Ms. Krinke would have any estimate on what the cost would be to go beyond what you do today, which is make it available to everybody if they request to see it. Thank you. And Senator Kiffmeyer. Oh, it was a question. I'm sorry. <coughs> Senator Drayheim comments to Senator Wicklin. I, 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 Chair, I think uh, Senator Wicklin had a question. For Ms. Krinke. Yeah. For Ms. Krinke. And About then I would like to cost. comment after the fact. Madam Chair, uh, Senator Wicklin, I, I don't have a hard number for today. I do know how many of these, uh, how many patients we see on an inpatient basis each year. We could sort of come up with a calculation on how many pages the, their statements would be. But this is also about the processing of those. The mail certainly is one cost, but also the cost to the call center. We know that, that Medicare and Medicaid patients in particular will obviously see the these statements and say, hey, wait a second, they will call the hospital. So we will have staff time involved with that process that is something that if you just send these to the patients that request it, then they know they're getting this full itemized bill rather than just people who all of a sudden get this in the mail. We're actually very worried that um, a Medicare patient will call and be very mad with the hospital, don't you know I have Medicare? We're worried about a Medicaid patient calling the hospital in tears and saying, I don't have the money to pay this bill. You know, we're kind of trying to think about what this does to our patient satisfaction in terms of getting a statement that people will not, there's no intention for them to pay this, but they're going to be getting this lengthy statement. I'm also with the electronic, I'm a little bit worried about this is personal health information. And so this would have to be some type of encryption if we were sending this out to people, um, as well as the mail um, for personal health information as well. So that's something that would would have to probably be an added cost as well as we figure that out. But. Thank you, Ms. Krinke. Senator Wicklin, was that sufficient? Okay, thank you. Uh, Senator Kiffmeyer. Thank you, Madam Chair. Uh, in regards to the email, I know that when a patient signs in, they sign many documents. There's no reason why in the process of doing that, you can't include, are you accepted, um, are you willing to accept uh, a detailed billing uh, by email? Very simple, just a part of it. I mean, we sign papers like crazy. This is hardly gonna make a difference. Also, in regards to some of these bills, we get them all the time. We said, this is not a bill in big print. Uh, it's pretty much able to clarify. You're always gonna have senior citizens and others who need help and you do that. They're probably gonna call you anyway because they're just the nature of that. But what I really wanted to say, there was a story I heard one time about um, a gentleman had uh, been called in to fix a machine. And afterwards he fixed the machine and he sent the bill. 
and it was quite a large sum. And they said, wait a minute, all you did was twist something. You, all you did was just that. You're going to charge us that much money to just do that? And the guy said, yes, I'll send you back a revised bill. The revised bill said the actual twist in the thing is a buck. For knowing where to do it, that's $2,000. Okay, so sometimes, not always, can you say that the judgment of physicians, of other healthcare professionals, most of the time they will walk into the room and matter of a few seconds, your skin color, your eye color, your general body uh, bearing and what you are doing, you will take one look at them and you'll have a pretty good sense of what's going on. They're not well. It tells you a lot. So that judgment of that professional walking into that room should not be underestimated just because they maybe only spent, quote, a few minutes because their long years of training and their medical knowledge that they have makes that extremely valuable, not so much the time that they did. But the other thing is understanding that when someone comes in, and this is just for the sake of those, because I think sometimes you guys are taking a tough beating here, but when somebody walks in, they can have the same symptoms and have a variety of many causes. It can be an aneurysm, can be a brain issue, can be a lung cancer. They don't know when you come in. That's why they do the tests. And it's really, you wish that the test that told you what it was would be the first one, but sometimes it's a process of elimination. It doesn't mean they weren't necessary, because sometimes that process of elimination is very, very important. And I just want to speak up for some of our practitioners and the reality of the work that they do. <coughs> Aside from that, though, the um, accounting of what was done, yes, we get in every other facet of life. Why should this be so different? Why should this be so different? And I think to put it together, I think the the intelligent people in the hospital association, all of the people who function in all of these hospitals, that they can put their heads together and figure this out. I think what we want to do is have language here that has enough flexibility and yet some specificity, and that's the line that we're trying to walk right now. I think we agree on the result, and I think we can all pitch together and accomplish that. Those are just my comments that I thought I wanted to speak to the situation, Madam Chair. Thank, Thank you. you. Senator Kiffmeyer. Senator Jensen. Thank you, Madam Chair. Thank you, Senator Dram, for bringing this bill to us, and thank you, Ms. Krinke, for your testimony. Without meaning to be presumptuous, uh, I, I do think that it, it might be best uh, to have the uh, bill assume the posture of a work in progress and, um, and allow uh, Ms. Krinke and her, her clients, if you will, uh, to go in depth on some of this. But I think the discussion is, is very, very important, and I think that it's clear that some of the intent on the transparency we work we've done over the last two years, this is a natural outgrowth of it. I have many patients who bring me their bills, and I can't tell what they are, and the acronyms and the abbreviations. I mean, I've looked at some women and said, it looks like you had a vasectomy. <laughs> and I know I'm not right. So I think that the idea of transparency and let's work to do this is appropriate. And I do think, huh, I said a lot funnier things that these two haven't laughed at before, so I'm not quite certain why I got the response I did. <laughs> but anyway, I think that this is a good plan. And I, but I do really second and reinforce all that you're trying to do, Senator Dram, in, trying to, in terms of trying to push the transparency. And thank you. And members, um, we are uh, approaching the end of our hearing. Um, I, I fully support uh, Senator Dreheim's objectives here. Um, I'll add my name to the bill if, if that's what we need to do. But I feel like there's a lot of concern about things that need to be worked out. And Ms. Krinke, I don't want you to take this as we're just going to go to the Medicare standard. Um, we need to do what's right for Minnesotans. When you, when you interact with patients and you see people trying to figure out jargon, this bill has a lot of people who aren't on Medicare, Medicaid, or don't have a big insurer that have to look at their bill and say, I was charged how much for a Tylenol? Or, and this is, a, you know, I'll take up a little more committee time. My husband had poison ivy so bad he couldn't close his hand. The ER doc walked in the room, didn't even put on gloves, and said, try some Fels naphtha and walked out. There was no way I was paying a bill for that visit. But you have to be a pretty engaged consumer to 
deal in that circumstance. And so in that light, um, and with all due respect for the work, I'm gonna ask you to place this bill on the table. Senator Draheim, you are a member of this committee. I hope you'll continue to do work. And, and I don't wanna tell the public we'll short notice this, but once we get language worked out, the committee will be ready to take it up. So thank you, Senator Draheim. Thank you, Chair. Will you make your motion? I'll move that uh, Senate file 13 is on the table. Members, all those in favor say aye. Aye. Opposed? Thank you, Senator Draheim. With that, members, we are adjourned. Thank you.